my screen. Yeah, why don't you? That looks perfect. All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, I'm delighted to welcome everybody to uh, the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds today, um, December the 13th, um, and delighted to introduce our speaker today, who's Dr. Josie. Josie completed his undergraduate degree at the University of Michigan, which warmed my heart. Uh, so I... Um, I uh, hope, Joe, that I can welcome you to the ranks of those of us who live in Georgia but are rooting for Michigan in the upcoming playoff. That's game. right. That's right. <laughs> Outstanding. Um, he completed medical school at the University of Toledo College of Medicine, his residency at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, and then his cardiology fellowship, his MSCR training, and a subspecialty fellowship in advanced cardiac and structural imaging here with us at Emory. Dr. C joined the faculty in 2020 as an assistant professor. His clinical practice includes a general cardiology clinic based out of Midtown. He reads cardiac CTs, and that's uh, highly germane to what he's going to talk to us about today, and performs intra-op echocardiography for the Structural Heart and Valve Program. His inpatient duties include rounding on the Structural Cardiology Service and rounding at the CCU in the CCU at both Midtown and EUH. And I can tell you from firsthand knowledge, um, speaking to the residents, that he is an extremely popular and beloved educator in those roles um, at this still very early stage in his career. So um, we're I guess very I bribe, I bribe the residents pretty well, I guess. <laughs> um, I don't think so, actually. I think that was all, you know, um, uh, uh, spontaneous. So um, so I'm, I'm grateful for those efforts and I'm grateful to you for joining us today and super excited to hear about really this um, new forefront of cardiology that I don't know very much about. So I'll let you um, take over. Well, great, Wendy, thank you so much for the introduction and, and thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I'll go ahead and, and get started here. So I don't have any disclosures. Um, over the next uh, 45 minutes or so, I'll, I'll kind of walk you through a brief history of cardiac CT, uh, what the current guidelines uh, uh, state are the indications for cardiac CT, as well as some more novel applications of cardiac CT that we do here at Emory. And there are a few um, indications that I think are, are pertinent for uh, even non-cardiologists, I think for uh, uh, internal medicine as a, as a whole. Uh, that you may or may not have thought of. Um, and then finally, kind of give you guys an overview of our cardiac CT infrastructure here at Emory. So I'll start with the case. So this is a 48-year-old male, hypertension, obesity, obesity, sleep apnea, and a family history of coronary disease who comes into clinic with intermittent chest pain. Now, the chest pain is sometimes exertional, but it's kind of difficult to gauge as his ambulation is limited by chronic back pain and knee pain but his vitals, his exam, and his EKG are, are unremarkable in clinic. And so the question is, well, what do you do about working up his chest pain further? So the options are put, in, put him on a treadmill, um, do an exercise treadmill test, a nuclear stress test, a coronary CT, or basically just phone a friend in cardiology. But before I jump into the case, let's first kind of uh, give you a background about cardiac CT. So Sir Godfrey Hounsfield um, introduced the first commercial scanner back in 1971. Now, what's interesting about Sir Hounsfield is that he worked for a company called Electric and Musical Industries back then. Now, EMI uh, was this giant British conglomerate that uh, not only had this research uh, arm that Dr. Hounsfield worked in, uh, 
but also they happened to be a record label. And so the most famous band signed under the record label was actually the Beatles. So the story is that the sales of the Beatles records actually helped fund the uh, R&D to create uh, a CT scanner. So there have been uh, many iterations of CT scanners over time. Um, 2004 was a big breakthrough with the creation of the 64 slice uh, CT scanner. And this is really where we started to see coronary CTA come into play. And we actually still have uh, uh, many 64 slice scanners out <clears throat> in clinical practice to this day. I wanted to kind of show you how the images in cardiac CT have kind of evolved over time. So this is a very early picture of what electron beam CT used to look like, followed by a single slice CT, followed by a multi-slice CT. And you can see that the image quality has greatly improved from a four slice scanner to a 16 slice scanner to a 64 slice scanner. And then finally to pictures that we are able to generate in this day and age with scanners that are as big as 320 slices. They can capture the entire heart with one rotation. Uh, and also scanners that have multiple detector heads and we can actually acquire pictures much faster and improve our temporal resolution of our images. So what do the guidelines say about cardiac CT? Well, they say a lot about how to use cardiac CT um, and, and calcium scores, as well as the evaluation of the coronary arteries. There's much less written about um, using cardiac CT to understand cardiac structure and morphology. And I think this is an area that I'm, I'm particularly interested in and where I see cardiac CT really kind of evolving into uh, its next iteration. But what I want to spend the next uh, several slides on is are, are how the guidelines talk about using cardiac CT in the evaluation of coronary disease. So as cardiologists, when we are evaluating patient, patients uh, with uh, for coronary artery disease, we're essentially thinking about testing in two different buckets. Um, the first bucket is what we call functional testing. Um, what functional testing is, is that we're essentially assessing for the hemodynamic consequences of uh, progressive obstructive coronary disease. Um, and so if you look at this diagram here on the right, this is kind of the classic diagram that we use in cardiology to kind of uh, uh, depict the ischemic cascade. And you can see here that our various imaging modalities, nuclear imaging, echocardiography, MRI, are really looking at the uh, physiologic consequences of increasing ischemia. And, and this is kind of the, the different stages that these imaging tests are useful in. And so when we think about functional testing for ischemia, we're essentially talking, our options are essentially plain old EKG, so putting the patient on a treadmill and seeing how the EKG changes, echocardiography, nuclear, which is SPECT or PET, or MRI. Much more recently, there was a new bucket uh, in the evaluation of coronary disease, and that is actually looking at coronary anatomy directly uh, in the what we call the anatomic uh, evaluation of coronary disease. And that's really only done in a non-invasive way by coronary CT. If you look at the uh, kind of our timeline of stress testing uh, in the world, for the last 50 some years, um, we've essentially been using uh, nuclear uh, cardiology. And so if you see, if you look at this timeline, coronary CTA really didn't come into play until the mid uh, or early 2000s. And it really didn't infiltrate into uh, you know, mainstream publications here in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this paper was actually published in late 2008. So it's not surprising that if you look at the, the volume of cardiac imaging done around the country, that nuclear cardiology, specs and PETs, really have dominated the landscape. And, and, and coronary CTA is just a small piece of the pie. And so the next question is, well, you know, if we've been doing nuclear cardiology, nuclear stress tests for 50 some years, why do we need to even think about another modality to evaluate patients with coronary disease? Well, the, the problem is that there's, there's kind of been this dirty secret in cardiology. And that is, we are actually not very good at identifying which patients should really get a diagnostic uh, left heart cath or coronary angiography. Again, and I want to clarify that this is in stable outpatients. Obviously, if someone comes in with a STEMI, it's a completely different situation. But this, this publication came out in about 2010, I think, and essentially looked at a nationwide sample 
of 400,000 outpatients who underwent a cardiac cath. And of these patients, the vast majority, 84%, actually had a, some sort of stress test before they had a heart cath. And what was astonishing to find was that less than 40% of patients were actually found to have a significant stenosis greater than 70% in any of their coronary arteries. And if you break this study down even more, and I uh, bring your attention to this box down here, in patients who, come, who came in with, state, with uh, typical angina, so with actual symptoms, and had a positive stress test, if you look at this blue grayish bar, a, a hair over 50% of them were actually found to have obstructive coronary disease on their heart cath. It was essentially a coin flip. And so if uh, a coronary angiography in the cath lab is our gold standard in diagnosing obstructive coronary disease, then why not come up with a non-invasive way of looking at the coronary arteries? So that's where coronary CTA really kind of came into play. And, you know, as I said earlier, over time, our image quality improved dramatically. And so we can obtain pretty nice pictures of the coronary arteries. And this is an example of someone who has essentially a normal coronary artery. This is an example of a patient who has very mild plaque in their coronary artery. This is someone with more moderate plaque in their coronaries. And this is obviously someone who has severe plaque. So studies started to kind of come out about coronary CTA. And you can clearly see how if, if someone has a little or no coronary disease, that coronary CTA is a fantastic tool of ruling out significant disease. In other words, it had great sensitivity. But the problem with coronary CT is that in patients who have more moderate stenosis, and I would actually uh, increase uh, this range from about 40% to 80%, uh, it was much harder to, to number one, coronary CTA uh, tended to overestimate uh, stenosis severity. And then number two, if someone has a stenosis of 60%, it's hard to determine whether or not that was actually clinically meaningful, that was actually severe enough to cause that patient's symptoms. And so because of that, the specificity for obstructive coronary disease was only moderate. And that was kind of the knock on, on doing coronary CT. And so our American Heart Association, uh, American College of Cardiology guidelines for the evaluation of stable coronary disease come out every 10 years or so. So in 2012, it gave coronary CTA a class 2B recommendation as an imaging modality. In contrast, it gave functional testing, specifically nuclear, card nuclear stress tests, a class 1 indication. And so this was almost a death blow to coronary CTA because in cardiology, at least, giving anything a class 2B recommendation essentially means there's not enough data to really support it. But since that time, there have been an increasing uh, amount of uh, good publications, robust publications that have studied using coronary CTA in both the acute chest pain population as well as the uh, stable uh, chest pain uh, population. And initially, a lot of these publications were in more uh, radiology-centric journals or in ER literature. But gradually, over time, we had more and more buy-in from cardiologists. And then the trials started getting bigger. The trials started to, be, to become published in uh, uh, more general medicine journals. Um, and then you can also see here that uh, our, our trial acronyms also improved over time. Anyway, coronary CTA essentially slowly became more and more mainstream over time. So in 2019, the Europeans, who are usually a couple of steps ahead of us, uh, they came out with an updated set of guidelines about the evaluation of stable coronary disease and essentially said that coronary CTA was also a class one recommendation. They further said that in patients who had a lower likelihood of having severe disease, in other words, in lower risk patients, that coronary CTA was probably a better test. And that in patients who had a higher probability of having obstructive coronary disease, that some sort of functional stress test was a preferred imaging modality. And the reason is because they thought that coronary CTA was a better rule out test, whereas um, a functional test was a better rule in test. Finally, just last year, 
um, our uh, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology guidelines were finally updated after 10 years and basically said the same thing. So they said that in patients with stable chest pain, CCTA, a coronary CTA, is now a class one recommendation with a level of evidence of A. And what was interesting actually was that they actually said that stress testing, functional stress testing, was also class one, but actually had a level of evidence of B. And they said this for both patients with stable chest pain and patients coming into the hospital with acute chest pain. So now if you look at kind of the timeline of our guidelines, and back in 1999, coronary CTA was actually not even mentioned. In 2012, coronary CTA was given a class 2B recommendation. And then last year, it got upgraded to a class 1. The Europeans actually took it one step further. In the UK, the, the NICE guidelines, NICE is kind of their version of the NIH, they actually basically said that any, any person with, with chest pain that you're worried about coronary disease, cardiac CT is actually the first line test across the board. Now for the, for the next part of the talk, let's go back to, to some of these cases. I'll show you some interesting cases. So going back to our, our initial case, this patient actually undergoes a coronary CTA. So this is a pretty standard uh, way that we look at coronary CTA. This is actually a 3D reconstruction of this patient's heart. And then we can actually cut through uh, the tissue and kind of just highlight the coronary tree, the coronary anatomy. And then we can highlight each vessel and look at the vessel uh, one at a time. So this here is this person's, uh, this patient's RCA. And you can see I'm, I'm basically spinning the RCA around its long axis and looking at the, at the vessel uh, in various different uh, views. And essentially this is a very normal looking RCA. Here is uh, the three, this middle panel is a 3D reconstruction of this RCA. And I've laid out this, I've manipulated this image to basically match up with how we would visualize the RCA in the cath lab. And then this final panel here, this person actually ended up getting a cath and you'll see why in a minute, but this is this person's RCA uh, on cath. And you can see that this vessel it basically is identical to, to uh, its course on CT. This is this patient's um, left circumflex vessel, which is also normal. This is this patient's uh, ramus branch, which looked okay as well. And then finally, here is the patient's LAD. And right here, as I'm spinning this around, the, the proximal LAD, there's a focal stenosis that's, that's pretty tight right here. And so this person was sent to the cath lab. And on cath, and I'll, I'll, I'll wait for this to load again here. I'll pause it here. You can see that there's a focal stenosis here in the prox LAD which also matches up with the, with the 3D reconstruction of the coronary artery. So this patient actually uh, underwent um, uh, a lima uh, to his LAD and is now doing fine. Let me show you another case. So this is a 59-year-old female with stable sarcoid, pulmonary sarcoid, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, who's been worked up for a few months because of recurrent shortness of breath and chest tightness, mostly non-exertional. I've um, had a pretty extensive workup recently that basically showed stable pulmonary function. Um, also underwent a nuclear stress test a few months ago that was unremarkable, a normal, had a normal EKG, had a normal echocardiogram. And so eventually the, the provider was like, let's just go ahead and do a, a coronary CTA I, because I'm not sure what's, what's driving this patient's symptoms. So if you look at this bottom panel here, I'm spinning around this patient's LAD and there's clearly a significant stenosis here in the prox uh, LAD. And then if I look at the cross section of this vessel, as I'm scrolling through the cross section, I'll rewind this video here, you can see that the vessel lumen essentially disappears and then kind of pops back up again. So this is a patient for, that we call a 90 to 99% stenosis in their prox LAD. And this is the patient's cath. And you can see that here in the LAD, there is indeed a very tight stenosis that the uh, intervention was called a 90% stenosis. And this person had a stent that very same day and is now doing fine. Here's a third case, 66 year old female, unexplained exertional dyspnea. She had a, an outside hospital, had a normal uh, nuclear stress test as well as a resting echo, but because of ongoing symptoms was, was referred here for cath. And this is the person's uh, left coronary artery injection um, and essentially big tortuous vessels, but there wasn't really anything uh, obvious. 
So then the interventionalists went to try to find the RCA, but then had a hard time finding the RCA. There were a number of, of uh, calf pictures taken, uh, injections taken, and really they couldn't really find the RCA. So this person was referred for a coronary CTA because they were concerned that either there was an anomalous RCA or that the RCA was occluded and that's why they couldn't find it. So again, this is the 3D reconstruction of the patient's heart. And we'll cut through the myocardial tissue and kind of just highlight the coronary tree. And I'll rewind this here in one second because there's something that's very interesting about this case. And that is that this person only has one coronary artery, only has a left coronary artery. And so this left main then branches out into the RCA. So the RCA was indeed anomalous. The LAD, the branches going to the RV are also coming off of the left side, the ramus and the big cirque. <clears throat> and that's, it's a pretty rare coronary anomaly, which uh, was actually the first time that I've seen that uh, uh, live. Next case, 60 year old male, hypertension, smoker, who had a syncopal episode at work. So EMS was called, the patient sent to Midtown. Initial troponin and EKG were unremarkable. The patient said that he may or may not had some stuttering chest pain before he passed out. So a CCTA was ordered by the inpatient team. And so here, we'll cut through the chest wall to get to the, to the heart, and then we'll kind of uh, cut away the heart tissue to highlight the coronary um, anatomy. And at least at first glance, it looks like, generally speaking, the, the coronary uh, anatomy is probably going to be normal. But we'll look at um, each vessel individually here. And so here is this patient's LAD. And you can see, so here's the left main, here's the LAD, here's the cert coming off over there. But with the LAD, you see some calcified plaque here in the proximal vessel, kind of scattered throughout the mid uh, vessel, more calcified plaque here in the mid to distal vessel. Here are the diagonal branches, which we don't see clearly in this one still frame, but they also had a uh, calcified plaque. The circumflex, there was calcified plaque approximately in the mid vessel. And then the RCA had calcified plaque in the proximal vessel, mid vessel, and then more in the distal vessel. But if you look at the actual lumen of this patient's coronaries, the actual lumen looks relatively preserved. So this is a patient who essentially had non-obstructive coronary disease but had a fairly extensive burden of atherosclerotic plaque. And if you look at his calcium score, he had a calcium score of 1100. If this patient had undergone some sort of functional testing first, like a uh, stress echo, a spec or something like that, that test would have probably been normal because this person doesn't have any obstructive coronary disease, but you would not have, you would not have appreciated the degree of atherosclerotic plaque he actually has in his heart. And so this is a patient that I would that I would manage very differently now seeing his coronary anatomy, because I would put this person on the highest dose statin possible, get his blood pressure down, and, and do everything else necessary um, to modify his risk. Last case. This is a this is a 67 year old female um, with chest pain in clinic. Uh, we did a coronary CTA on her, and here this is her RCA. You see that there's been a there's a chunk missing out of the, the mid RCA right here. And so we call this a 60 to 70% stenosis in her mid RCA. This person was sent to the cath lab. And what was interesting about this case is on cath, this is her mid RCA. It actually doesn't look as bad in the cath lab as it does on her coronary CT. And this is an example of what I mentioned earlier, that coronary CT can overestimate stenosis severity. However, because this looks so much worse than coronary CT, and because it's still technically a, an intermediate stenosis on cath, the interventionalist went ahead and did what's called an FFR. So what's FFR? FFR stands for fractional flow reserve. It's essentially where the interventionalist, they put a pressure wire down to the coronary across the stenosis, and they're comparing the pressure distal to the stenosis versus the pressure proximal to the stenosis. So if there is a drop in pressure across the stenosis of more than 20%, in other words, if the FFR is less than 0 0.8, then that suggests that this stenosis is in fact functionally or hemodynamically significant. And this is, this is what the interventionists will use in patients who have 
in intermediate stenosis. The reason I bring this up is because we can do something similar now using CT. We can actually get a non-invasive uh, measurement of FFR using CT. And, and there's a lot of uh, high-level math, high-level physics, and computational flow dynamics that kind of go into this. But essentially, there have been a number of trials that have compared CT-derived FFR with invasive FFR. And the correlation is pretty good. And as you can imagine, that doing CTFFR or adding CTFFR on top of regular coronary CT increases your diagnostic accuracy. And so our, our guidelines that were updated last year also said that in patients who get a coronary CT, if you have an intermediate stenosis, that it's reasonable to go ahead and get a CTFFR um, evaluation done, or you could do some sort of follow-up functional test to see if, if that intermediate stenosis is actually clinically um, uh, significant. At the time of this patient's coronary CTA, we did not have the ability to do CTFFR at Emory. But since then, we did get that technology, or not that technology, but we, we did partner up with a third-party vendor um, to, to run this analysis for us. And so as a quality check, we actually sent this patient's coronary CT for uh, FFR analysis. And what it turned out is that that mid-RCA stenosis right here was in fact not functionally significant at a CT FFR 0.88. So if we had this technology available to us at the time of this patient's coronary CT, we would have run this analysis and probably saved her an invasive procedure. So the next part of my talk, um, I, I kind of want to go over a few examples of some uh, non-coronary applications or some more novel applications of cardiac CT that I think are, are somewhat unique here at Emory. Now, there has been a lot of buy-in from other subspecialties, even within cardiology, about some of these other uh, uses of cardiac CT. Um, but you know, for the purpose of this talk, I do think there are a couple of things that, that might be relevant for the internists in, in the audience, either on the wards uh, or uh, in clinic. And so the first thing I wanted to, to highlight for you guys is that you can actually use cardiac CT to rule out thrombus, in particular, left atrial appendage thrombus. So the left atrium um, and the left atrial appendage is actually a fairly easy structure to visualize using CT. And it's this, this structure right here. And so if we saw a filling defect in the left atrial appendage, that would be highly concerning for thrombus. And so there have been a number of studies that have compared CT versus TEE for left atrial appendage or clot rollout, either prior to cardioversion or in patients who have had a stroke. And the sensitivity of CT was fantastic. It was 100%. And the specificity was 99%. Now, I, I do want to caution you and, and to highlight that th these were all observational studies. There is an ongoing randomized controlled trial comparing CT versus TE, but my guess is, is that it's probably going to be um, uh, non-inferior. So with that said, TE is still the gold standard for appendage rule out uh, for clot. However, I, I do think that there's a real utility of cardiac CT in patients if there are any kind of contraindication for TE. And we've actually been using cardiac CT for this uh, quite extensively, at least at Emory Midtown. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, you know, in patients where it's either difficult to pass the TE probe or you're getting inadequate images, uh, patients who um, there are any issues with uh, them undergoing anesthesia. Uh, and then particularly in the COVID era, you know, patients who are on airborne uh, isolation precautions and you can't do a TEE, I think a cardiac CT is a great alternative. Um, and then also some of the other kind of routine uh, contraindications uh, for TE, such as patients who have loose teeth, who have esophageal strictures, varices, recent GI bleeding. You know, these are all patients for whom I think um, it's reasonable to consider cardiac CT. And then finally, the other thing to consider is if you need any additional secondary information. Um, certainly if, if you know the patient or you have concerns that the patient has a PFO or an ASD, then maybe TE is a better uh, imaging modality. But if the patient also has, you know, mildly elevated troponin and, or they have, were having chest pain as well. You know, a CT, you could also take a look at the coronaries and be, you know, two, two birds, one stone type of deal. One part of cardiac CT 
is a little bit of show and tell now um, that I'm very excited about is that we can actually derive TEV images from our CT's reading software. So I have the ability to actually uh, have a three uh, virtual TEE probe that I can manipulate uh, using, the, using the software program in the exact same way that I would manipulate the probe in a real live TEE. And here in this picture here, I'm actually using this uh, virtual TEE probe to get the exact appendage views that we would do in a live TEE. And I'll just fast forward this and if you just kind of remember what this appendage looks like here and here, keep that in mind. This is the patient's actual TE. It was, it's identical. And so we've been, we've been using, we're actually using this more uh, to help our uh, electrophysiologist plan uh, left atrial uh, appendage occlusion procedures. But I think that that's an area of, of cardiac CT that I'm, I'm very interested in. So uh, one other area that I think internists might be interested in, and that's the evaluation of cardiac function using CT. So <clears throat> the other thing with cardiac CT is I can manipulate the images to basically recreate all of the standard transthoracic echo views uh, that we would usually obtain. And so here I'm essentially creating a four chamber, a two chamber, and a short axis of the heart. And I can play the image. And essentially you can easily tell that this person's LV function is probably normal. And there, there really isn't any regional wall motion abnormalities. We can also use our software to draw out the endocardial borders. And if we are able to draw out the endocardial borders, that means we're able to measure your end diastolic volume, your end systolic volume, and then by definition, are able to calculate a stroke volume and a ejection fraction. And so in this particular case, this person's LVEF was 66%, RVEF of 49%. And we know that cardiac CT functional analysis matches up very well with cardiac MRI. This is something that might be relevant, particularly for those of you, you know, on the wards at Grady, at the VA, or I guess also at the Emory locations as well. Patients who have very difficult echo windows. This is the case of a 70-year-old lady who had uh, a STEMI, was in cardiogenic shock, and this is her transthoracic echo. You can see globally that her LV function probably isn't normal. You see something metal in her heart, and that's what an impella looks like. But I don't think you truly appreciate her LV dimensions, LV function, or any kind of other anatomic abnormality. So this patient actually ended up getting a cardiac CT. And if I, again, recreate some of those echo windows for this patient, you very quickly notice that this person has a giant inferior wall aneurysm as a complication of her STEMI. You can see it here in the two chamber view, and you can see it here in the short axis. And this is um, you know, something that we didn't really appreciate on her uh, echocardiogram. Um, and you can also tell obviously that her LV function is very uh, abnormal as compared to the last case um, that I showed you. Uh, there are other structural abnormalities that we can pick up on with cardiac CT. This is the patient with an ASD. This is the RV, the LV, the left atrium, and the right atrium. And you see that there's a gap here in the interatrial septum. And you see a flow of contrast actually from the left atrium into the right atrium. So this is the patient with an ASD. And you can also appreciate that both the RV and the RA are both dilated, which makes sense in someone with a left or right shunt. This is a patient with a cardiac mass that we instantly picked up on. In this particular case, this person had a large mass across their pulmonic valve that was actually prolapsing in and out of, of their uh, pulmonic valve. And speaking of valves, this is um, what a normal aortic valve looks like, a normal tri-leaflet aortic valve that's opening and closing. And here is the left coronary leaflet, the right coronary leaflet, and the non. And this is, in contrast, someone who has significant aortic stenosis. You can see that this person's non-coronary leaflet is basically fixed, and you can kind of see the calcium uh, at the level of the leaflets as well. This is someone who has a bicuspid uh, aortic valve. And uh, you have to be surprised that, you know, looking at the, or, or trying to figure out how many leaflets someone may have an aortic valve actually is not as easy as it may be uh, on echocardiography. This is someone that 
their echocardiogram was read as being having a normal trileaflet aortic valve. And in this case, this is someone who has a unicuspid aortic valve. And on this person's um, uh, transthoracic echo, you couldn't even tell how many lesions there were. We can also look at prosthetic valves. This is a normal bileaflet mechanical aortic valve opening and closing. And what's What's, uh, what I think is kind of cool uh, with cardiac CT is on the 3D pictures that we can create, it's actually very easy to kind of isolate any metal objects in the heart. And so this is the same person, the same per patient's mechanical aortic valve, and you can kind of see how the valve opens and closes in 3D. Um, our cardiac CT program provides a lot of um, pre-procedural support for our structural team. When we're planning TAVR procedures, we almost exclusively use cardiac CT to understand the anatomy of the aortic valve and the aortic root, and to basically try different valve uh, valves in different valve sizes to see which one uh, we think would uh, you know, essentially fit. Um, and then we can, we can assess for transcatheter valve replacement, both in the aortic position as well as in the mitral position, and also at the same time assess for any potential uh, paraprocedural complications. And then, lastly, um, this is an area of cardiac CT that, uh, admittedly, we're not we're not using regularly, but I think um, is going to be a game changer uh, one day, hopefully in the near future. And that is actually fusing our CT images to live X-ray. Or, or fluoroscopy in the cath lab to actually guide live cath cases. This is a patient where we took a CT of the abdomen and pelvis and basically fused it to the floor of, uh, uh, fluoroscopy in the cath lab. And in this particular case, uh, we, we marked where in the IVC and where in the aorta it would be safe for the interventionalist to take a wire and poke a hole from the IVC into the aorta in order to bypass significant uh, femoral arterial disease. So the last few minutes, um, I, I just want to give you guys an overview of our infrastructure here at Emory. So there is a lot of heterogeneity across uh, our different campuses in terms of uh, readers, in terms of uh, reading software, as well as the actual CT scanners. Um, at Midtown, uh, cardiac CTs are read by cardiologists. Um, at Clifton, it's a mix of cardiology and radiology. At St. Joe's, it's uh, read by cardiology. And then at Grady and the VA, it's, it's read exclusively by uh, radiology. I wanted to kind of show you some of our, uh, how our cardiac imaging volume has changed, at least at Midtown. Um, our cardiac CT scanner went live in April of 2019. And you can see how our volume with cardiac CT in this white line has really kind of accelerated uh, relative to nuclear imaging, um, at least at Midtown. So with the increased volume of cardiac CT and coronary CT and with increased interest, um, we are getting a lot more referrals, both on the inpatient side and on the outpatient side to, to scan patients, which is fantastic. But um, at the same time, we are getting uh, a lot of providers who are ordering these scans who you know, are not quite as familiar with some of the potential uh, contraindications. And um, with all imaging tests, uh, bad data in is bad data out. And so we, we try to do our best to uh, maintain our uh, quality. And so there are a few uh, things that I wanted to point out that I think that um, you, should, you guys should know in terms of when you're thinking about ordering a cardiac CT or coronary CT. The first thing is uh, heart rate control. Um, tachycardia is a, is a killer uh, in, in terms of imaging uh, quality that really it causes these terrible motion artifacts and it makes it impossible to look at the, the coronary uh, uh, artery lumens. And the reason is that the coronary arteries are perpetually moving because they're, they sit in the epicardium and they move with a cardiac motion. But what's interesting is that the coronary arteries move the least in early diastole. And the only way, or not the only way, but the best way of, of increasing your diastolic time is by slowing the heart rate down. And so that's why when you guys order a coronary CT on the inpatient service, one of the cardiology fellows will probably call you and say, hey, can you please give X amount of uh, metoprolol? We really need to get the heart rate down as low as possible. 
Now this, this um, varies uh, across the campuses. At least at Midtown, our scanner is not as good in terms of patients with faster heart rates. So we really try to get the heart rates down into the 60s. Whereas at uh, St. Joe's and at Clifton, uh, their type of scanner, they can accommodate patients with faster heart rates. And so heart rates of, I've seen patients getting scanned with heart rates of 80 with, with pretty decent uh, results. The other thing is we always, almost always get a calcium score, which is a non-contrast CT scan before we do the contrast injection, just to get a sense of what the patient's calcium score is. This is an example of a patient with a calcium score of almost 2,200 of which 940 is in the LED alone. And I, this may be hard to see with the glare, but um, there's a ton of calcium here in the Prox LED. And you can't really see what the actual lumen of the vessel looks like. And that's because calcium causes an artifact called a blooming artifact. And it can obscure the lumen of the vessel and can make the plaque look a lot worse than what it actually is. But we don't have an absolute threshold for when we would say we're not gonna scan the patient because here's an example of a patient with a calcium score of just about 1,000 of which 600 is in the LED. But in this patient, that calcium is kind of more scattered throughout the vessel. And you can clearly see that there is still a healthy tract of contrast through the vessel in someone who probably has non-obstructive coronary disease. And then finally, we will always, almost always ask you what the patient's weight is. This is an example of a patient with a BMI of 57. And what happens is that um, we, can't, we don't get great contrast opacification of the coronary arteries, there's terrible contrast to noise ratio. The scan looks essentially like it's washed out. But again, we don't have a hard threshold or cutoff for when we wouldn't scan a patient. Obviously this patient's a lot smaller, uh, her BMI was only 42, but you can clearly see that, at least in this particular case, that we can still get a pretty good look at the coronary vessel. In this case, this person has a very normal uh, coronary artery. So there are a lot of nuances um, in terms of patient selection for coronary or cardiac CT. And, and the thing is, is that at least at, at Emory Midtown, our fellows screen every single one of our cases. And so um, we'll walk you through some of these nuances and we're very involved in making sure that we're able to deliver um, a diagnostic result for you. So in conclusion, um, you know, there's, I think, significant growth of cardiac CT over time, and I think there's still incredible potential, growth potential for cardiac CT. You know, locally, we're, we're seeing an increased volume of coronary CTs ordered, uh, which we're all very happy about. Um, but I, I wanted to convey, you know, importantly, that cardiac CT is, is growing to not just be a tool to look at uh, uh, or evaluate patients with chest pain and look at the coronaries. I think there's uh, uh, an important utility of cardiac CT across multiple disciplines in medicine. Um, and so I hope I, I gave you guys a few ideas of, of when to potentially order cardiac CT in your own practice. And then there's a few things in the horizon in terms of machine learning and more kind of deep diving into uh, plaque morphology that I think are, are quite exciting as well. I just wanted to highlight our team at Emory Midtown, um, uh, who have worked very hard to keep up with increased volume, as well as uh, at the same time maintaining our CT quality. And with that, Happy to take any questions. All right, my mind is a little bit blown by some of those images. That's uh, <laughs> it's really extraordinary. Um, uh, actually, Dr. Bailey here asking uh, in the chat, any um, risk from a renal standpoint asked like a good nephrologist? Yeah, so yeah, great, great question. Um, um, obviously we have to give some degree of, of contrast um, it really depends on, and this is one of those things where there's some nuances in terms of the indication and some, some more patient specific factors. So um, for a coronary CTA, at least at Midtown, our default uh, contrast volume is 60 to 65 cc's. But that depends on what the patient's body size is. It depends on how good their IV is. It depends on uh, what their GFR is. Um, and so for, for, obviously there are an infinite number of, of, uh, uh, of answers to this, but um, let's say for instance, they had a GFR of 45 and they were an average sized person, uh, we could probably get away with 55 cc's of contrast. But we, again, this is why we have, in order to maintain our quality and also for patient safety, you know, we screen every single uh, study that comes across. Can you contrast that for me? Like, what's the volume of contrast that's used in a cath? 
Uh, well, so that's a good question too. It also depends on uh, which uh, which year cardiology fellow is doing the, the cath. Uh, but I would say for an experienced interventional cardiologist, um, and it also depends on if they are just doing a, a straight up diagnostic cath that's normal. A normal diagnostic cath, you could probably get away with 10 cc's of contrast. But if you are taking someone from the cath lab with a STEMI and you know that you're gonna have to PCI uh, an artery or in more advanced cases where they're opening up chronic occlusions, you're talking about 90, 100 cc's of contrast, if not more. Another uh, way to, to, to put this in perspective is um, for a CTPE protocol, for instance, that radiologists will run, they, I think they're giving around 90 to 100 cc's of contrast. So, but anyway, in, in the cardiac CT world, we, we can sometimes give half dose contrast, 40, 50 cc's of contrast, but it depends on what we're looking for, depends on the patient size and some of these other factors. All right. So now you have a number of questions that are related to what can you see? So okay. can cardiac CT report global longitudinal strain in addition to EF? Um, I don't think there have been some, some very early papers that have tried to um, do that. Um, it's very difficult and we have not started doing that at Emory, but that's a great question and a great idea, I think, for one a potential future application. Okay, then um, thanks for the information on detecting LAA clots. Any data or experiencing look any data or experience looking for LAA smoke? Um, and similarly, um, neurology wants a TE on new stroke patients, but it's hard to get them scheduled. Um, is it adequate for those indications? Yeah, so so also good questions. Uh, with regards to the LAA smoke question, um, one thing I didn't uh, put in the presentation was that um, in patients who have slow filling of their appendage, which in echo terms, usually what you'll see is smoke, echo smoke. You'll see um, some filling defect or you can see some filling defect in the appendage on CT. We have this special protocol for all clots where we do a second scan, we call it a delayed phase scan, where we literally wait 30 seconds and then we scan the patient again. And the purpose of that is if there is truly slow filling of the appendage, i.e. smoke, that on the repeat scan, after you wait 30 seconds or 45 seconds, that if there, if there truly isn't clot, that the appendage will clear out, that you'll see contrast fill to the, to the tip of the um, uh, appendage. And so this, this actually increases uh, you know, the specificity of using cardiac CT to detect uh, clot. Uh, with regards to the second question about um, appendage, uh, where neurology wants TE, but this can take days to get scheduled, weekends, et cetera. Um, so, you know, again, the first thing to, to just point out again is that from, from a guideline standpoint, strictly speaking, TE is still the gold standard. Um, so I do want to caution you about that. If there's not a clear contraindication, um, I, I still prefer TE over CT. However, um, you know, we have admittedly done CTs just from a logi logistical standpoint if we couldn't get a TE uh, quick enough. So yes, the short answer is yes, we have done something like that before. Um, but with that said, our sites kind of vary on whether or not we offer cardiac CT on the weekends and on holidays and, and after 5 p.m. Um, it is still technically an outpatient imaging modality, just like regular stress tests are. Um, and so at least at our Emory locations, we wouldn't usually do a cardiac CT after hours or on weekends, except for in very select situations. All right. And then uh, uh, Dr. Allen asks, and I'm curious about this answer too, um, have you looked at CCTA for vegetations um, in the context of endocarditis and the sensitivity specificity? Yeah, so um, I think I, I can't quote the exact numbers for you because uh, this question has been is, was has been raised by other people as well in the past. I, I think it's it's a it will be a very specific study because if we can see a vegetation, then for sure that person is infected. Um, but however, I don't know if it's a great rule out test because there are some vegetations that are quite small, and a lot of vegetations also tend to flicker around 
And so the temporal resolution of cardiac CT, I don't think, um, at least at Midtown, is not good enough to capture some of these very small filamentous uh, uh, vegetations. The other thing is sometimes vegetations can grow on leads. And for instance, um, uh, like a pacemaker lead, right? And pacemaker leads usually will create some sort of metal artifact, and that can actually shadow out any potential vegetation. So to answer your question, I, I don't know the exact numbers, um, but I do think that TEE is still um, the better modality for infective endocarditis. But with that said, I do think that CT is, is a good complement. So in patients who have, we're also concerned about root abscess or something like that, I think CT can kind of uh, assess for some of these other paravagular complications. All right. How about non-calcified plaque? Can you see? Can you see that? Yeah. So um, actually, that that case, um, uh, I think I forget number case number five. I think where I showed you where we overestimated the plaque severity on CT. That patient actually had predominantly non-calcified plaque. Um, and this is why in, in patients who have acute chest pain, I would caution providers on just strictly ordering a calcium score because you can miss out on plaque that has not calcified yet. And we have seen many cases uh, of patients who had fairly significant stenosis that was predominantly non-calcified. But again, the, the, the clinical context matters. So in patients with acute chest pain and the inpatient side of things, I do think if you're going to do a, some sort of CT, you should do a contrasted CT study. Clinical context always matters. So um, can cardiac CT help determine flow impact of serial lesions in one artery, whether serial lesions in a single vessel might benefit from rebask? You know, that's, that's a good question um, and, and a, a more nuanced question, uh, which makes sense because it's coming from uh, one of our cardiologists. Um, but, uh, you know, I think with FFR, with CTFFR, you should still be able to, let's say you had multiple lesions from the prox to mid uh, vessel. I think you, just like in the cath lab, I think you should be able to, to look at the FFR distal to all those lesions. And if that is still significant, then I think, you know, that, that you would apply it the same way that you would do with invasive FFR. And a question I have, um, I get confused about when, what the indications are for cardiac CT versus cardiac MRI. So um, they are, uh, so cardiac MRI uses, um, well, there are a lot of differences. Cardiac MRI uses a magnet. So there's no, there's no radiation. Um, and the type of contrast that MRI uses is also uh, very different and, and for, most people, we, th we think of cardiac MRI as being safe for the kidneys uh, versus using contrast in cardiac CT. Um, so the imaging modalities and the, and the scanners and everything are completely different. The other thing though is from an indication standpoint, um, looking at the coronary arteries, uh, cardiac CT is uh, superior. Looking at function and morphology, MRI is probably superior. Okay, yeah, that was the the point that I was curious about. Um, any other questions? We've peppered you with rapid fire here. Anybody can feel free to raise their hand. Apparently not. Um, this is super exciting and, uh, and I can't wait to see how many new applications um, you guys continue to evolve um, with this. And for a non-invasive technology, I think that that's incredibly powerful. So thank you so much, Dr. C. It's been fantastic having you um, with us today and, uh, and I've really enjoyed this. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity.